we come to the definition of philosophy. The real definition of philosophy, as contrasted with the nominal definition, tells us that philosophy is the science of all things naturally knowable to man's unaided powers, and so far as these things are studied in their deepest causes and reasons. We shall presently ponder each phrase of this definition. But first, it will be well to inspect the meaning of the term philosophy as it is loosely employed in casual speech. We often hear such expressions as these. The philosophy of education, the philosophy of religion, business philosophy, the philosophy of history. Now, what does the term philosophy mean in all these uses, or what at least does it suggest? It suggests, first of all, a body of reasoned truths or of conclusions regarded as truths. Further, it suggests that these truths are the background, the basis, and the ultimate explanation of the thing to which they are referred to as a philosophy. Thus, the expression the philosophy of education suggests a body of reason, truths, or principles, or values, which give meaning to the word education, which show the worth of education, and which indicate, in a basic way, the best means of achieving and imparting it. Again, the expression the philosophy of style, that is, of literary style, means, as it does in Herbert Spencer's little book, which bears the title, The Root Reasons, which are, uh, back of all, the rules of grammar and rhetoric. Therefore, the philosophy of anything suggests the sum total and system of reasoned truths which are back of the thing and give it meaning. Of any activity or procedure, of any plan, of any program, of any way of life, the reasoned basis is called its philosophy. Here, of course, we have the term philosophy in a very restricted meaning, even a metaphorical meaning. Philosophy, thus restricted, comes close to what people usually mean when they use that horrible misnomer, ideology. We have no quarrel with such a restricted use of the term, but it is not in this sense that we employ it in the present treatise. In this study, we use the term philosophy to indicate the science of all things knowable, the science which is man's ultimate effort to interpret the universe. We do not use the term to mean the basis of some one effort or some one phase of human activity or interest. We do not speak of the philosophy of this or that. We speak of philosophy. Our concern is philosophy in its first meaning as the universal science, not in its restricted or metaphorical meaning as a special or particularized science. Reverting now to the real definition of philosophy, we find that we have called it the science of all things naturally knowable to man's unaided powers, insofar as these things are studied in their deepest, their ultimate causes and reasons. This definition must be learned with care. We must be sure of the precise meaning of its every phrase. First, philosophy is a science. Science, considered objectively, is a body of related data, set forth systematically, expressed with completeness, and presented together with the evidence, proofs, and explanations, which justifies and establishes these data as certain and true. Science, considered subjectively, is scientific knowledge in the mind of a person. It is knowledge that is rounded, systematic, evidenced, and complete. A science is objectively any branch or department of things knowable which presents related data with certitude, proof, system, completeness. A science, subjectively, is a person's certain, evidenced, systematic, rounded knowledge of things knowable. When we say that philosophy is a science, we take the term science objectively. We mean that philosophy is a body of related data that is systematic, complete, evidenced, and certain. It is to be noted in passing that the evidence or proof requisite for a science is not merely experimental or laboratorian evidence. Evidence may also be, as in the case of pure mathematics, reasoned or rational evidence. This point is important because many teachers of our times have presumed to limit science to the domain of the laboratory and the statistician, arbitrarily ruling out rational evidence from the realm of true science. Such a ruling is blind and brazen impudence. It is also self-contradictory, for no amount of laboratory and data, no number of experiments, no catalog of statistics can amount to scientific evidence unless reason reduces them to unity and order and draws conclusions from them.
And neither the nature and value of reasoning nor the basic force of the conclusions drawn by reason can be tested by laboratory and devices or proved by experimental methods. We, therefore, reject the positivistic, sensistic, materialistic, and empiricist doctrine that pure reasoning is of no scientific value. Philosophy is a rational or reasoned science, not a laboratorian science. Philosophy does indeed use the findings of the laboratory and sciences, but it is not confined or hampered by their limitations. It sheds its great light upon the data of the laboratory sciences, serving the scientist as daylight serves the laborer or the mechanic, and in its turn it draws from them illustration and even direction for its efforts. But it is not fettered by their methods or subjected to their special requirements. Second, philosophy is the science of all knowable things. In a day of intense specialization, it seems silly to say that there is a single science of everything. Nearly all the sciences we know of, and notably the positive sciences which keep our laboratorians busy, are partial or departmental sciences. Each of these deals with a branch of knowledge, and each is divided into almost endless departments and sub-departments. In the face of this bewildering maze of sciences, how can we think of one science which embraces in its scope every possible object of human knowing? Yet, there inevitably is such a science. Even those who scoff at the assertion of its bare possibility are forced to assume its existence and to build their findings upon it as a necessary base. A little thought will convince anyone that there must be such a science. The difficulty suggested by the variety and multiplicity of partial sciences is merely a seeming difficulty. Cardinal Mercier has an enlightening word to say on this point in his Manual of Modern Scholastic Philosophy. Quote, Philosophy does not profess to be a particularized science with a place alongside other such sciences and a restricted domain of its own for investigation. It comes after the particular sciences and ranks above them, dealing in an ultimate fashion with their respective objects, inquiring into their connections and the relations of these connections, until it finally arrives at notions so simple that they defy analysis and so general that there is no limit to their application. So understood, it is a living fact, and it has a history of more than 2,000 years." Unquote. Indeed, as the Cardinal goes on to point out, it is impossible to have any particularized science without some fundamental grasp or some assumption of universal truths. The very existence of particularized or partial sciences affirms the existence of a non-particularized science, that is, of philosophy. For it is as impossible to have a partial science without reference to a universal science as it is impossible to have words without reference to a language, or even to have parts without reference to a whole. Not that philosophy is the simple sum total of partial sciences. No, the relation of the particular sciences to philosophy is not the relation of constituent parts or elements to a totality which is their sum. Rather, it is the relation of elements to a reality which is other and greater than themselves. Somewhat similarly, a building, which is called a triumph of architecture, is something other and something greater than any or all of the bricks and beams used in constructing it. A living plant is something more than a simple sum of parts. A language is more than a list of words. A literature more than a sum of sentences. The glorious harmonies of a musical masterpiece make something other and greater than a sum of notes. To dwell for a moment on the last illustration, we may notice that the harmonies of a musical composition come after and rank above the individual notes that make it up. The composition is not a simple addition of note to note. It involves more than single notes or chords sounded in sequence. It involves notes and chords in their relations, their interpretations, their fusions, and a reality which is both other and greater than themselves. So. Philosophy, which is the science of all things, and therefore includes all other sciences and their objects, comes after and ranks above the partial sciences, and is other and greater than the sum total of all these. Philosophy achieves its place by drawing into basic unities the vast and bewildering world of knowables with which all other sciences deal piecemeal. Third, philosophy is the science of all things naturally knowable to man. Philosophy investigates all that man can know by the use of his unaided knowing powers, that is, by the use of his intellect or reason working upon the data gathered by his senses. 
philosophy does not investigate what man has come to know by divine revelation, except, indeed, insofar as he could have known this without such revelation. For this reason, philosophy is called a human science in contrast with the divine science of Christian theology. Philosophy, indeed, is the queen of human sciences.